Welcome friends to the second unit lesson of personal finance. In this unit lesson we're going to discuss the culture of debt. We're going to look at credit, debt reduction, and purchasing strategies. And from the wisest person in the world the advice to us has been given the borrower is servant to the lender. The culture of debt. My friends were living in it. In the United States, it's how we operate. It's how our economy is financed, both publicly with public debt, the national debt, and of course with privately with credit cards, car loans, of course mortgages, but more so than that, just, just the things that we want to buy. Since the early 2000s, two decades into this millennia, the typical America family has been spending 120% of their take-home pay. We stopped for a little bit, right about 2010, 11, 12, just a little bit, and it ramped right back up. How do you do that? Yeah, this is what the picture looks like. You've got to pull out credit cards. You've got to pull out money that you do not have. And hopefully you'll pay it back to finance some of the things that we want and need. The typical consumer household in the United States has 54000 just about sixty grand worth of consumer debt. And that's just cars, credit cards, debt. That's not mortgage debt. That's not student loan debt. It's just the things that we like to buy. So we have some problems. We're going to see how we can manage them better in this unit lesson. So here's what we're going to do. We're going to look at the types of credit that you will need in life. Yes, you do need credit. I know there are some financial consultants out there who say uh, rip all your credit cards up, cut them in half, you don't need a credit score. Well, if you're a multimillionaire, um, then, you're, then you can get along without it. But most of us are working people, so we need good credit. We need a good credit score, possibly the most important financial number that you're going to have. So we're going to have, look at how to build that. Yes, we will tackle student loan. More than likely, some of us are going to have to have some, some loan uh, dollars on our education. Okay, we'll look at that. But we're going to look at strategies of how we can manage and pay that off. And of course, if we ever get into too much debt, we're going to look at the debt snowball, how to pay off all sorts of debt, how to pay it off fast. That's a great strategy because it can be overwhelming, very overwhelming. 70% of Americans are overwhelmed right now with their debts. So we're going to have some strategies to get rid of it, strategies to purchase the things that we like, and of course, we will also look at automobile and home ownership issues and, and how to get the best out of the biggest purchases that we'll ever make. So let's jump in. What is consumer credit? What's credit to begin with? It's an arrangement to receive the things that we really want now and then pay for them in the future. So I want something now, but I really don't have all the money for it. I'm going to buy on credit and pay it back. I'll also incur finance charges on that too. Consumer credit is basically the credit for personal needs. And what's very interesting is consumer credit is, <clears throat> is as far as looking at the history, <coughs> pardon me, of, of the United States, consumer credit really didn't come out until like 1970. So it's, it's still you know, only you know, 40, 50 years of, of, of history we have with consumer credit. You know, back in the day, you had to buy that car in cash. You did get to finance your home, but the home is not consumer credit. That, that's investment credit. So we have just seen an explosion in this industry from basically 50 years to the trillions of dollars that consumer credit takes in each year. It's very interesting as we move through this. So... <clears throat> Three ways consumers can finance our purchases. All right. Well, let's look at this. So you see something you like. Uh, maybe it's expensive. Maybe it's a professional camera that you want to get. You know, everyone's doing videos, of course. Uh, YouTubing is now basically a career, and so you want to get a really nice camera. And there's many to choose from. Maybe you'll pick the Sony A7 III. Uh, it's about $2,000 brand new with a kit lens. So do I draw on my savings for that camera? 
look at my bank account and said, okay, I could do that and, and maybe you could pay that off in cash, but you don't want to deplete all your savings. Of course, you could use your present earnings. That means uh, your paycheck that you just received, although that already may be earmarked for other things you got to pay for. Or you borrow against your expected future in the income, uh, your, your, your future income. Like, you know, hey, I'll just, I'll put it on a credit card. I'll see if there's a... Uh, uh, any debt, any uh, high, uh, store credits I could get, and then just pay throughout the years and pay it off. So those are our ways that we purchase. Trade-offs, again, I could pay that beautiful camera off. Oh, I also need a nice lens, so now maybe $2,500 uh, to get the best, and I don't have an emergency fund left, so I've depleted my savings. Again, buying that beautiful camera probably is not an emergency so we don't want to ever touch that emergency fund for our just purchases so yes we can deplete it spending current income uh, re reduces our well-being too for instance if I did buy that camera and now I've got to buy food for the rest of the month and my rent and car payments you know, we get ourselves in a different cycle and of course spending future income reduces funds for future expenses which means once you've got that credit and you're paying it off each month for that camera, you know, you're reducing what else, the other things that you could buy. So, always a trade-off with everything in life. So let's look at some of the uses and misuses of credit. Because once you get that first credit card, it's, uh, it's very interesting. And now we're trying to give them to high school students. But... You know, there's not a lot of emotion when you swipe through with a credit card. And so it can be very addicting to buy things because there's no emotion. There's no check or money being written or your debit card being depleted. So before you use credit for major purchases, here's something interesting to look through as you're reading through your chapters here. Do I have a cash for the down payment? That's a good sign right there. Certainly for your bigger purchases, an automobile or a, or a home, if you're borrowing for the down payment and then borrowing again for the actual loan, uh, those are your red flags right there. You probably have to stop and say, I got to look at, I got to do something different. Do I want to use my savings for this purchase? Again, does it fit my budget? Uh, could I use credit in some, if, if, that I need in some better way? Okay, because again, you may need that credit for different things in life. Can I postpone the purchase? What are the opportunity costs? What's the dollar and psychological cost of using credit for this purchase? If we went through this list, if Americans went through this list, every time they bought something that was, you know, one of those pretty, pretty good sized items there, they would probably not purchase as much, wouldn't we? So those are some good tips right there on a major purchase and I'm thinking major purchase anything five hundred dollars or more certainly more now credit is great to have okay it's not the credit that's bad it's just the it's just what we do with it again it is a major force in the American economy without it our economy doubtfully in 2019 our uh, GDP, gross domestic product, was probably 20 to $22 trillion. Take credit out of there, it may only be $10 trillion. It may be half that. It may be, it may be less than half of that. So we know it's a huge force in our, in our economy. And the advantages are I get immediate access to goods and services, which is nice. We, we do get that instant gratification. Um, I can purchase when I don't have the money. And again, that's why we, we definitely want our credit, because sometimes it can be lean in life. Will we go through different periods in our life cycle, uh, career and financially, where we, we need to lean on credit and, and some of the better, and some of the times that we don't have the funds. So it's a cushion for your emergencies. All right. Uh, it's easier to return merchandise. It is easier to pay. I, I, I think we would all agree with that today. It's very easy. In fact, it's maybe too easy. Uh, it's very convenient, and of course, we are going into a stage that we may have talked on the last unit where many businesses are just not accepting cash anymore. Uh, doesn't mean you have to use a credit card. You could certainly use your debit card without a problem, but uh, it is very convenient. Okay, those are the advantages. 
One monthly payment, that's nice. It is safer than cash. Uh, obviously, if you've ever rented a car, if you've ever gone to a hotel, uh, you've got to have a credit card. They're, they're not going to let you, unless you know it's, it's a different type of establishment, but 99% of the time, you would need a hotel reservation with, put on a credit card. Take advantage of float time and grace periods and indicates financial stability. We can certainly use credit to our advantage and we can put everything on that one card or two cards and pay, pay one payment a month. And again, you can float until your next paycheck and as long as you pay everything off, at the end of that billing cycle, you can avoid interest charges most of the time. So, fantastic, dude. What are you, why are you even saying credit's a bad thing? Again, it is the misuse of it. It's the great temptation to overspend. Yeah, we're at the mall, we're at Bass Pro Shops, we're at Victoria's Secret. Uh, I need that. I like that. I like that outfit. I like those Johnson Murphy shoes. Of course, I like that Shimano fishing equipment. Yeah, yeah. Sephora, uh, Sephora I'll just load up my bag. And, you know, again, when you're just swiping through, there's not a lot of emotion. If you had to lay down Benjamin Franklin's and you and and uh, Grant's and Jefferson's, we would probably, and Andrew Jackson's, we probably wouldn't spend as much, would we? So, it is a temptation to overspend. The failure to repay your loans is not good, okay? Um, it can be a loss of income, valuable property, especially if it's a collateralized loan. The bank can simply take back the car. That's not a problem for them. They don't want to, but they can. Um, you may have to sell things off, and again, you will ruin your credit score. And then when you need that credit score in the future, uh, it, it's a it's bad deal right there, friends, if we do not pay. The misuse of credit, again, family relationships, um, if we look at divorce rates throughout the United States, generally speaking, there's a drive. We're always fighting all the time. Well, there's probably that fear of the money is not in, we're, we're over indebted and the money's not coming in and we're not managing money very well. It, it's just, it just, it just blows up into so many different things. And credit is expensive. I mean, you're not given that credit for free. There's an interest rate and the interest rate is just what you pay to borrow money. So, uh, and I do like this. It really does not increase your total purchasing power. It just gives the illusion that you can purchase more. But you got to pay it back. Types of credit, okay? So now we know the good things about it. And again, some of the disadvantages of it. We just don't want to lead ourselves into temptation to buy things we really don't need, okay? We have secured loans, we have unsecured loans, the unsecured loans, no collateral. Secured means collateral. So your car that you bought and you borrowed against it, that's the collateral. If I can't make the payments after so many months, the repo person comes and they take that car away. The home becomes foreclosed on. And the student loans, well, we'll look at that in a second. So a closed-ended credit is basically a specific purpose. You buy a house, you're going to be offered a mortgage. We'll, we'll look at that. You have a, a typical mortgage is a 30-year note. So in 30 years, that mortgage loan will be paid off, you know, in, in a perfect world, right? If you keep that house for 30 years. And so it is a closed end. You know exactly how much you're going to pay every time. Automobiles are usually the same way. You have a three, four, I think there's even eight-year loans out there. But that payment exists the same amount, the average car payment in the United States, is about $475. We don't want to be average. We want to be below average, don't we? So $475 for a typical car, just the car payment alone, that's interest and the principal, every month for the four years. And then after that 48-month period, you're done. Okay. So open-ended credit means it's just open-ended. You, you have that. It's always at your per usual. So that's what a credit card basically is. You pay the interest and finance charges if you didn't pay your bill in due, in, in full. So if you charge your $500 for some uh, clothes over the weekend and you pay that $500 back, then you're pretty much good without immediately without any interest charges. If you say, well, I'm just going to pay 50 bucks a month. Well, so 500 divided by 50 is 10. 
so in 10 months, but there's interest charges. But, you know, it can just keep going on and on. So uh, the biggest thing on open credit is that you have a credit limit. So the biggest limitation on open credit is your credit limit. Maybe it's $500, maybe it's $1,000. But again, that's your limit and it's revolving. So, uh, and it's moving. So there's our big differences. The closed ended credit, again, your mortgage, your automobile, any type of installment loans. And of course, open ended is your credit cards, Visa, MasterCard, Dillard's, uh, whatever department store credit that you have. And of course, the debit card. Now, the debit card uh, basically has replaced the check, and for, for, for various reasons, and many of them all good, uh, it is very safe, you know, and um, you don't have to write that check out. I wonder how many of our students here have actually ever written a check and then balanced a checkbook. It's a beating to balance that checkbook. Now you've got online bill pay. You can just check your balance any, any given time, and you can always look for any type of fraudulent uses. But uh, the ATM, all right, uh, I'm sorry, your debit card, you can, you can use it most everywhere. Uh, it will usually be backed by Visa or MasterCard, and, but it is not credit. You are actually being debited, so your amount is taken out of your bank account. And it does help as you build credit, though. It does give you a boost in your credit score as long as you do not have an overdraft. Okay, when you don't, that means you've spent more than there's in your account. So, just so we go over that. If we look at just straight credit cards, which means I do not, you know, that gives me a time to pay it back. 70% of Americans have at least one credit card, okay? And, and if you do not have a credit card, my friends, uh, right now, I, I would suggest that you get one. And we'll look at some ways you can do that. About half of all uses are convenience users and pay the balance in the full each month. Okay, you buy a few things and you pay it in full. So that, that's great. Uh, most other people do carry a balance and that means you're paying finance charges. So anytime you use the card, you're basically getting some sort of a transaction fee. Either the merchant is getting it, definitely getting it. Uh, even if you use some cash advances. advances. And we have a lot of co-branding here. So a lot of people want to get in this game. A lot of finance companies do. Uh, it is a huge industry. In a given year, in the United States, there's $3 trillion worth of transactions just on a credit card. And there's a lot of fees in there. So people, banks and finance companies want to put one of these in your hands. Be careful when they do. Oh, isn't that the feeling? The smile right there. You get that credit card. And it's good. You feel like, hey, my credit score is good. Somebody believes in me. Uh, I've got some responsibility. Uh, I like that. I can remember my first credit card. I felt that same way. And there is deep, and I mean deep, psychology in the first credit card that you ever get. You will more than likely, again, using about a 60 to 70% retention rate, you will always have that card throughout your life because it was the first one you got. Think about that. You still have your first credit card. You may have more, but you still have the first company that, that got you one. You, 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 you keep it. So we go out, we grab it. Here's how the game is played. It is game theory. You need a credit card to build your credit score, especially those of us who are just coming out of the high school era. All right, we're, we're 19, 20, 21, 22, under 25. Yes, we need to start building our credit. So, here's how the game is played, though. These are giant organizations. They're giant corporations. Visa, Amex, Discover, MasterCard, others. Every year, they'll put 100 mil just into advertising. They lobby like crazy to get cards in everyone's hand. They have lobbyists in the United States Congress uh, always say, you know, again, that they don't have to follow the same rules that other people do. And again, there's that psychology. They're not net profit. This is on a yearly annual basis is $30 billion. That's a net profit. Now, if you've taken an accounting course, you, you know, typically your net profits are anywhere from 3 to 5% of your 
gross sales uh, on a legitimate business. Okay, I didn't say anything illegal. Uh, so now look at that number. And that's a $30 billion profit, and they may be 5% or 3% of total sales. That's how this is a tr 3 to 4 to $5 trillion operation every year in the United States. Here's the rules of engagement. Okay? Um, remember, it is very difficult to beat them at their game. Many of you have heard of Elizabeth Warren. She ran, she, she ran for the Democratic ticket. Uh, she is a senator from Massachusetts, but before that, she was the lead bankruptcy lawyer professor for Harvard University. Yes, Harvard. And she took her graduating class every semester, and she pulled out various credit card statements. And she says, I want you, as my top class here, now you're, you're majoring in law and you're, and you're going to specialize in bankruptcy, how to how finance charges are occurred, how they charge them, what is your you know what is your payback to avoid? I mean, she gave a litany of things that uh, they should be able to answer. She said, "I give you you know you have until Friday to get it done." And so her top class came back and said, uh, "Professor Warren, we uh, we've done everything. We could, we cannot give you." She wanted it to the penny. Like I want to know exactly to the penny how how these things are financed and how their calculations are done. And they said, we, we, we can't do it. And so she ripped them up and down. You know, I cannot believe this. You are going out into the world and you're, and, you're, and you're Harvard graduates. Yeah, blah, 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 blah. And then she stopped and paused and says, you know what? I cannot figure it out either. I just want to let you know that. This is how the game is played, my friends. That's 90 days, same as cash. And that means 90 days, no interest. Or the six months, no interest, no financing. But you've got to pay the accrued interest if you don't pay back in six months. A lot of department stores do a, a big job on this. PayPal does it. Uh, Best Buy, you should do it like crazy. They still do. 84% of the time, the consumers get nailed with back interest, which means you did not pay it all back. And now they accrue the interest from day one. And that interest is about 26%. Yikes, there's an extra one or two hundred dollars you're going to owe in the interest charges. So be very careful. 84 uh, percent. I'm not a gambling person, but I believe Las Vegas is about a 70 percent win rate. So this is better than, than Las These are better odds than Las Vegas has. So do today. Here's a couple of things on the game is played. 30 percent of profits. Again. 30% of that $30 billion that we just talked about comes from late fees and overextended credit. I don't want to be entirely cynical uh, all the time. I really don't. But friends, you, you have to have some cynicism in you to survive. They really want you to be late. They want you to be overextended. Not everybody, but they know who their target market is because that's how they make so much of their money. And it's easy. It's just bam. You owe an extra 50 bucks right there. You got a late fee. You're overextended. There's another $30 fee. Just tacking on fees all the time. So this is why we have to be careful. Understand how, they're, how they operate. Rebates. Don't ever get sucked into a rebate. General Motors, other car companies, Ford, doesn't matter. Uh, they, they will have, they, they're in this game too. And so they have an affinity card that if, and that just means it's theirs, uh, if you, you know, we'll give you 5% back on a new car purchase on all your credit card charges. Wow, that sounds good. Yeah, but is it? Let's just do an example here. And Dave Ramsey did this example. You would have to spend $80,000. You charge $80,000, and so that means you got to spend it, on your credit card. So a 5% of $80,000 is only $4,000. So you get a $4,000 rebate. And of course, unless you're buying a Bentley, uh, and they're not going to do a squirrely deal like this anyway, you just lost six grand on the car when you drove it off the lot. The depreciation just hits you immediately on a brand new uh, American-made car. Uh, and so you drove it off the lot, you just lost $6,000, and you spent $80,000 to get a $4,000. It's not a good deal. It is not a good deal. The airline miles... Um, 
if that's if travel is your thing and you know how to play the game right but um, most of the miles about 70 percent of the miles each year go unclaimed and and they roll and they roll off uh, so that's not what we're interested in we're not interested in a rebate here we go all right the big the TV room we need it yes we need it so there's your TV room ultimate home stereo I love it you go out and purchase a 10, 10 grand over the weekend. You have a credit card that pays, it's only charging you a 13% interest rate. And, and if you have that, then you have excellent credit. That is a very good rate. So there's what you do. You say, you know what? I got my room. I got it set up. I'm ready to watch my movies, my sports, everything that I want. 150 bucks a month. That's not a bad payment. How much and how long will it take you to pay that off? Interesting. So think of a think of a number there, and don't try to calculate all the interest. I had someone do that one time, try to get his calculator out, and then you know just stop. Just 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 give me a give me your ballpark number there. Is it going to be twelve thousand dollars? Would it be like fourteen thousand? Would it take me four, five, six years? It would take you ten years to pay that off at eighteen thousand dollars. Here's what's interesting. It was only ten thousand. I paid it off. I actually paid it off in like five and a half years. I spent the last four and a half years on this entertainment system just paying interest, eight grand. Interesting thought, isn't it? And how good is this entertainment system going to be in ten years? I mean, will it even work after five years? Now let's just do this. Let's just change the interest rate. Okay, 18%, which is much more likely to get. 18% interest rate, and no, never mind that the Federal Reserve is giving banks 0% interest, which they've done for about 30 years now, and the bank is charging you 18%. We're, we're not going to think about that. 18% at 150 a month, it'll take you 30 years to pay that back. You paid it back in five and a half years to $10,000, which meant you basically just paid $44,000 worth of interest those last 24 and a half years. Is this a great deal? There you are, right there. 29%, uh, which is like a Providian credit card, all we did was mess with the interest rate. We didn't add anything else to it. 29% won't compute if with a 29% rate that is interest because, you, unfortunately, it's over 100 years, so you wouldn't be alive. You'd have to start paying two hundred and fifty dollars a month, uh, or two seventy-five. I computed, and it would still take you over thirty-five years to pay back. And how? I mean, I, I I pulled this out because I had my nephew uh, do this, and he pulled out this gutted house and pulled out this entertainment system, and I said, uh, "What did you do again? Uh, how much are you paying?" And once his wife found out and the calculation, she, you know, they're very young, and uh, they said, we're selling some of it. We're going to take it back. And they did. So, interesting. All right. You got your credit card. There's some things that you're immediately going to do. The fraud is huge right now. We know that identity theft is at all time high. Every day it gets bigger, bigger. So, you get a card make sure you sign it don't just put the card envelope and throw it you know somewhere treat it like it's money because that's where it is so keep it in a secure place if you don't have in your wallet all the time that's fine but have something uh some sort of a case that you have in a secret drawer all right uh shred anything with your account number once you get your bills if you're doing paper bills you can do e-bills but again they store that just digi digitally so uh, shred your accounts. Don't give that card information over the phone. Okay? Unless you initiated the call, there are so many scams out there, and they scam senior citizens the worst. And those who English is not their first language. And I've seen it, it could have happened to my mother in law, that they'll say it's a bill, and it could be like from um, Encore. It could be a reputable company, but it's not them, it's just someone using their name and saying, you owe $300 and we're going to shut your service down today. And so they have all sorts of gimmicks. Says, give me your credit card number or the IRS. 
IRS, what did I say in the first uh, unit? The IRS will never call you on the phone. They initiate everything through mail. So uh, unless you're calling the company to, to buy something, do not give them your credit card number over the phone. Get the receipts, look at the transactions. Uh, again, once you, if you have ever a dispute and so much with your online billing and you get your credit card statement online, you can basically just check it right there and say, I don't, I don't think this is my charge. And they'll get back with you uh, and, uh, or notify them immediately. Don't just not pay it because you, you've got to go through the steps. And if you've ever had your identity stolen, then you've got to get a police report. And it's not that difficult anymore. The police are, are very much on this, and they'll tell you they'll have, they have uh, officers that are basically just set up for that, uh, any type of fraud or identity theft. And they'll go through the motions, and then you notify the, the credit bureaus if you have to. But at any rate, so when that new card comes in, sign it, treat it like it's money, and uh, don't, uh, don't ever give it to a friend. My friends, don't ever do that. I'm not going to be happy. Other types of credit. As you mature, all right, you have a house. Generally, homes have had great, great appreciation and value uh, always. Uh, and certainly in these last years and homes right now in the year 2020 and, and going forward are just are blowing up, which means what you paid for it, what your mortgage is, you may have a mortgage You've been paying on for a while, only seventy thousand dollars left, and yet your house is worth close to three hundred. So now you have two hundred and thirty thousand dollars worth of what's called equity, and so banks will give you lines of credit against your home. And sometimes this can be uh, very, very beneficial. And so you can either get a home equity loan or a home equity line of credit. And basically, what that is is they'll say that let's say it's a hundred thousand dollars. Of equity you have, they'll bank will give you eighty five percent of that, which is eighty five thousand dollars, and they'll say that is your line of credit, and so you can either get that into one full loan and do home improvements, uh, or you can get it as a HELOC, and that is a home equity line of credit, which is right there, and then it's like a giant credit card, so to speak. If you ever need to, it will down. You can. Um, have a transaction and you can borrow money, have it downloaded right into your account. And that usually lasts on the HELOC 10 years and the home equity loan. And then you can buy, then you can convert it into a home equity loan. But having equity in your home does give you a lot of more potential for purchasing things that you need, especially if you have to do home improvement items to it or if your uh, go, children are going to college or if you're trying to finance some of your business operations. Uh, the home equity line of credit that HELOC has become extremely popular in the past five to six years. So those are other sources of credit. Measuring your capacity, we're always asking, can you afford the loan? Okay, Do you, can you meet all your expenses? So you're going for the car, all right? Uh, you're going for something else. Can you, your bass boat, you know? Can you afford that with, with making the loan payment? All right. Do you have to give something else up? What are you prepared to make the trade off? Well, we won't go out to eat as much. Okay. I won't spend money on clothes or things. I, I want this instead. Now, that, that, that's always the first steps of how this is going to affect my monthly plan on the loan. And then, of course, we look at debt to income ratios. So, debt payments to income ratio it looks like this. These are just some, what you would call safeguards to kind of determine your financial health. You would divide your monthly debt payments by your net monthly income. And so for this equation, we're not going to use our house payment or, or the debt uh, from our mortgage. We're going to just take that one out. So we'll look at our other monthly debt, which is going to be mainly our consumer, okay, credit, to our net monthly income. So, when you divide like your credit card payments, okay, your car payments, uh, anything else, and I would go ahead and put your student loan payments in here too, and divide that by your, definitely would, by your net monthly income. So, you, you should not exceed 20% of your after-tax income. So, this number right in here, okay, should not be more than 0.2. Why? Because you still have that rent, 
okay, that mortgage payment. You have food, you have insurances, you have utilities. I mean, you have a lot of other things. Now, if you're living at home, then uh, you want to just max everything you can to pay off all your debts before you get out. Let's keep looking at this. So, debt payments to income, let's say you've got monthly income is $21.36. All right, now that's that's very close to a $40,000 a year income, but once you take everything out and you get your net pay, taxes, insurance, et cetera, et cetera, uh, even some retirement, that's that's what you get. And let's say you had 426. Now 426 is not terrible because if you have a car payment, we know the average car payment is closer to 450, 470. Okay. And so this ratio right here is 19.9. So it's basically it's 20%. That's you're, you're, you're at a max right there, especially if you're living on your own or you've got a family because, you know, it gets a lot more expensive just after, just after your, your, uh, your debt payments there for your consumer credit. So that gives you some, some financial health guidelines right in there. Here's something else. So we use this in the business world. It's a debt to equity ratio. That's your total liabilities divided by your net worth. And again, if you don't want to include the home, the mortgage, and the mortgage in there as well, uh, we can take that out. So your total liability, so take out the mortgage and and we're also going to take out the value of the home too, unless your house is paid for. If your house is paid for, then then you're in great shape. All right. So this again, obviously, it's got to be less than one because we're using division here. If it's more than one, then we are in all sorts of problems. So twenty thousand dollars of debt. Okay, you have one hundred and twenty thousand uh, dollars of assets. So your debts are what seventeen percent of your total assets. When you get somewhere between over 80% of your debts to assets, uh, which means you have a lot of debt and you just don't have that many assets, my friends, these are warning signs. <clears throat> you can hit the brakes real quick. You can have the, the meeting of the minds with your family, with yourself to say, okay, I got to change this equation. Uh, I've got to get more net worth and that's not easy to do. But uh, one way to make that number lower is start shredding and shedding your liability. Sell stuff if you have to uh, and, and, and pay down debt and get that under control because you just uh, you don't have any money left over to do anything else. Your credit rating. Okay. Good credit is a, is a tremendous asset that should be nurtured and protected. Okay. Limit your borrowing capacity to repay. Live up to the terms of your contracts. Check to see what the credit report and most creditors on reports will always, not most, I mean, everyone's going to look at that credit report to see, does Randy get that car? Does he get that house? Do we give him a new credit card? Do we up his limits? Et cetera, et cetera. So this is huge right in here, our credit scores. Credit bureaus, uh, collect information, Experian, TransUnion, Equifax, and you can go to their website. You only need one. Uh, I do, uh, you can do Equifax or, or Experian, and they can, for about 20 bucks a month, they will monitor, they will uh, lock down your credit, they will tell you if anything has happened, they'll give you your credit score. If you've ever, ever had an identity uh, breach and someone has used your credit, they did this to my daughter when she turned 16, we had no idea that someone got a $500 credit because and then she could never get credit herself so we cleaned all that up and we got the one of those three there and it's been great they locked down her social security number she, you know only she can get uh, uploads and credit when when she unlocks her credit score when she unlocks her, her experience account and uh, it's very very good it, it's worth the 20 bucks a month especially if you've ever been compromised so uh, yeah, uh, there's a lot of stuff that goes out there, so we always want to look at our credit report, okay? Bankrupts, court records, merchants, credit card companies, all of the sorts of stuff. Now, generally, they don't report until someone is in payments that are three months or older of, non, of non-payment. Uh, and then you can always call, but we're going to look at that strategy here in a second here. We need to maintain it. we got to build it, okay? So, these are some things that are in your file. And this is how we found out on my daughter that it wasn't her because they had a Georgia address. 
And once I said that to the uh, credit card company that was just really mean to us as well, I said, we've never lived at that address. And they go, oh, okay, we need to file a police report. You need to do all, and we did. And it was a, wasn't a big hassle, but it certainly wasn't anything pleasant. Uh, but you got to do it. And so there we are. Yes, look down here. Insufficient funds. Friends, don't, don't, don't think that that doesn't hurt your credit rating. Uh, and again, checks return. You're saying, well, I don't write checks. Okay, debits that were bounced, debit cards because you had insufficient funds. That does go on your credit rating and does get reported to credit bureaus, which is your credit rating. So make sure, you know, uh, and I know sometimes we think there's the money in there and it's not. Uh, make sure that transfer, for those of us who are, hopefully all of us are doing some sort of online banking, Make sure that there's always sufficient funds before you purchase and hit that debit card up. Here's some things we never want to do, and that's cosign a loan. Now, right now, maybe some of, depending on, on, on our class, I, I know some of us are just getting into the credit era, and we need someone to cosign, like a parent, to cosign a loan. Okay. And maybe as parents in here, your children are needing to cosign. Okay, that's one thing. But co-signing for a friend, that is a bad deal every single time. Okay, so if I need someone to co-sign for me, okay, that, and I'm asking you, hey, could you help me and co-sign? And, and a friend comes up to you and asks that, or even a sibling, that <laughs> doesn't matter, uh, you got to think, wait a second, if, if Randy can't get credit, and credit is very available, something must be wrong. Here's what's happening. I am asking you to be the guarantee of my debt. So if you can afford, all right, you're going to co-sign on a car for me, say a $20,000 car, you're basically assuming that $20,000 debt. Just because you put your law, I just, I just wrote my signature, all right? I just clicked the box and checked yes. I didn't know. Well, it doesn't matter. IDK doesn't matter anywhere in the financial world. I don't know. That doesn't get you anywhere. Okay, good. It means you are now the borrower. So, when that borrower didn't pay, and I can assure you that borrower will not pay, you have to put that full amount and any late fees. And sometimes you can't take over the payments. you got to pay it in full. So, generally speaking, well, what about uh, if Randy missed a few payments? Don't, doesn't the debtor uh, go after him? Nope. They don't go after me. They go after you if you co-sign for me. All right. Uh, so, is that making sense right there? Don't do it. If you do, all right. If someone just cries and talks to you, think about these questions. Can you afford to pay it? If not, this will, this will blow your credit rating up by not paying for it. The liability for this debt prevents you from getting others that you want. I mean, it, it, it just has led so many people down to a very long way to get back to where they wanted to be in their credit rating. Again, you may pledge property. You could say, well, okay, I guess I'll, I'll put my car up against that, or I'll put up uh, my motorcycle, I'll put up something else on my home. You could lose that. Also, you want to check that state laws, request a copy of any overdue payment notices to be sent to you. To say, and that's great to say, you uh, you send me because that's the that's the kicker right here. Uh, many times you just get a letter in the mail saying, you know, Randy did not pay his car debt with interest accrued. It's now twenty five thousand, and we need the payments in immediately. And you're just shaking reading that. So any time you do this, to say, let me know all overdue payments are sent right to me, so I can get this thing. So you could, you know, at least get the loan up to where it needs to be. But you know, the best advice to say here. Don't do it. Don't co-sign. You are legally responsible for that debt. It will ruin your credit, so do not do it. Fair Credit Reporting. Fair Credit Reporting Act. This act regulates the use of your credit reports. And so if something is wrong on it, you get to delete it. Of obsolete information, you have erroneous data corrected and only authorized people have access to your reports. And adverse data can be reported seven years, which means if you've had any type of um, collections, that can be on your report for seven years, and bankruptcies can be on for at least 10. 
So it's always good to know that you have the opportunity, again, having access and having the service to one of the credit bureaus. Uh, you pay uh, each month for that, but it can be very useful for you because you always have access to that report and they email you when your credit limit goes up, if it's dropping, if anyone has tried to open up an account. The great thing is you can lock your account. So if someone does get your information, your social security number, and tries to open up a loan, automatically it won't happen because they say your credit's locked. And then generally that person is you know, running away. So as you apply for credit, okay, here's what creditors look for. It's called the five C's character. Do you pay your bills on time? Well, I've never had a credit card. So they're going to look at your debit account and see have you ever been overdrawn. Capacity. Can you repay the loan? Do you have an income coming in? And if you don't, then that's when they I may ask for a cosigner. Capital, what is your net worth? Collateral, do you have any property to pledge against the loan? So generally speaking, if you were to buy a home, the value of the home would have to exceed, or at least meet, if not exceed, the amount of your mortgage. And of course, what economic conditions could affect your ability to repay the loan. So we're going to look at this. All right. This is some really good practicality here. It's Vantage 3.0. It's FICO. It's your credit score. And that's what bureaus and that's what issuing banks look at with a magnifying glass your credit score. So what is a credit score? Credit score predicts the likelihood that you will pay back your loan or credit card balance. And it issues the price you pay for money. So let's check it out. And the grades that we're used to in a course is generally zero to a hundred. A credit score, zero is 300. And the perfect is 850. So 300 to 850 points. And that's pretty much Vantage 3.0 in, in the FICO credit scoring companies do this. So now you at least know what we're dealing with and where are where we need to be. Higher the score, the better credit we have and the better amounts of credit and lower interest rates we're going to receive. So factors that determine it. So there's the calculation. Calculation first and foremost has always been your percent of on-time payments. As long as you're paying your bills on time, then you get a, a good credit score. We also look at the open credit card utilization. Any type of derogatory marks, a collection, unfortunately a bankruptcy is a mark that is very hard to overcome and still get good credit. The average age of your open credit accounts, the total number of accounts you have, and of course the total hard credit inquiries. So let's look at each one of those. And again, why do, should we care? What does it mean? Poor is anything from three to 600 points. Fair is mid 600s to low 700s. Good is 720 and above, seven to 749. Excellent is 750 and above. Their Nirvana is the perfection of 850. Maybe that's a number that uh, is a, can, can rarely be attained. Uh, the average American credit score in the United States, I've done some research on this, is 678, just to let you know. So, let's get ours up. If you have a credit right now, great. Let's see what we can do to get our credit score the highest. And if we're just starting out, here we go. If you are just starting out, okay, we need to get a credit card. So for those of us who do not have a credit card uh, and we may not even have an income right now, can you still get a card? Probably so. And, but you need to have a bank, which was why we went in the first unit, financial services, why banks or, say, or uh, credit unions are so important. If you have a bank account, okay, and a savings account, checking, debit, and savings, you can ask your bank, is it possible for you to have a secured credit card? And that basically says, 
I'll take $500 from my savings or $300 or whatever amount that you feel comfortable with, and that will be secured, which means they will use that. They will partition that money and say, you have a credit limit of $500, and of course, if you don't ever pay back, we can just take it right from your account. But this will at least get you into the game, and then you start charging a little bit each month and paying it back. So if you do not have a credit card and you've applied in the past and they've been rejected, uh, that is a great way to start it with a secured credit. And it's also good because you know you can never spend more than whatever credit amount that you've set up with the bank. So, again, why does FICO, why does Vanish Repoyo so important? These right in here, my friends, you pay the lowest amount of interest for your loans. You pay very high amounts of interest for your loans if you're in this era area right here. Okay? You could have the same job as somebody else. And uh, if you don't have a very good credit score, if I don't have a great credit score, I'm going to be paying double the amount for my purchases because I'm going to repay it all through interest. That's why it is so, so important. Again, the higher the score, the lower the loan amount. There you are. 4.25% mortgage over 30 years versus a 7.25%. Now, 7.25% is, is, is high now, but it, but it wasn't in too, too bad. That is a hundred grand of interest over that 30 years, just if you have that lower rate. 1.99% versus on a car loan versus 14%. 325 versus 625. It's just the interest because, again, the banks are saying Randy's a high credit risk. Um, he's going to have to pay much more for his loan. What about jobs? Uh, many companies, especially if you're trying to get some sort of a security clearance, if you work for an organization that deals with the government, uh, they're going to look for security clearances. And if your credit rating is not that good, it's, it could cost you a job. So it's very, very important. All right, here we go. Let's maintain it. How do I maintain that? Use credit wisely. So um, if you have a credit card, we know what to do. If you just got that advice that I told you, go to the bank, ask for secured credit. Let's get, let, let's get it rolling. Charge $20 to $40 per month on the card. Pay it back every month. So if you have some cards that have zeroed out balances and you're not doing anything with them right now, there's a few of us out there who just say, you know what, I'm good. I really don't even need to use my credit. I would still suggest you do this. Uh, because many times when a credit card company sees that a card is inactive, they start lowering your credit limit and they may even close it after a couple of years. I almost had that done on one card because I hadn't used it in a year. And they said, sir, we, and so, you know, I got that back up. So pay back every minute. Never miss a payment. Have you ever been late before? It's easy to do. We have so much going on in our lives. Check the dates. Please always have, you know, you're, again, your good organization for your personal finances. Maybe you've got a desk, maybe you've got a, a drawer just dedicated to them. You have all your bills lined up somewhere, uh, even an envelope system. Uh, and again, if we're on bill pay, we pretty much have an idea every month. You can check when the last time you paid a bill, which is the great thing about bill pay. If you ever are late, and we've been late before, we all, we all have, call immediately. You just tell them, I am so sorry. Please don't hit me with a late charge. If you can catch it in time, uh, they'll 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 uh, they'll do that. They'll, they'll they won't charge you a late fee, and say I've already made the bill pay. It's going out this week, uh, or, or the checks in the mail. Always call. Never in our financial, uh, in our personal finances, think that this stuff just goes away. Uh, it's always great. Always want to be proactive on any situation if we're running into some problems and so call that creditor. Uh, your, your utilization, we never want to go over 30% of our credit limit. So if you have a thousand dollar credit limit and you're pegging that thing to $900 every month, that's, that's going to that's gonna hit that credit score down. Anything under 30%, okay? So as we're looking right now, as we're watching our course in this video, uh, well, you're saying, hey, I've got like three credit cards right now, um, and they're at $1,000, and as long as you've had your credit for over a year, call your company, credit card company up. I do this once a year. 
and say, can I get a, a limit raise? It's not because I want to spend more. I want to make this bigger. So all of a sudden, this goes to $3,000, and now you can do $1,000 without a problem. Get what I'm saying? Call your credit card company, for those of you who do have some credit already out there, and ask for a limit raise. It will increase your score, and that's always a good thing. Once you've had that secured credit card for over a year at that bank, now you can go back, and of course you have a, a job, probably. Uh, go and ask them, can I, can I transition this credit card to unsecured and get a bigger limit? Usually a year of good credit, good things will start happening to you. All right. This is a great little piece I found. It's the seven habits of people with excellent credit scores, 715 above. Taken from Stephen Covey's book, big title, Seven Habits of Highly Effective People. Number one, pay on time. Okay, again, this is the top factor in your credit scoring models. A late penalty, a late payment will quickly bring down that score. Seven, ninety-six percent of the people with seven fifteen above are never late. Here's another interesting fact: seventy percent of people with six fifty score or lower have multiple accounts past due. Takeaway here, never miss a payment. Get very organized on that. Two, minimize your use of available credit. Do not be maxed out. This is the second factor in your credit scoring models. 96% of people with 750 and above, and that's the excellent credit score, that's what we want, have only used 10% of their available credit. Those with 650 and below, 75% are at 95% of their credit. There's a lot of percentages right there. That means they are just maxed out and that score is going to just keep going lower and lower. So we're using strategy here to build our credit score. Get that credit card, make sure they're in use, but we're paying back every month. We're not making big purchases. We're just utilizing a strategy to in to build that credit and we're also asking for our credit limits to be raised because that will raise our available credit line. The low balances, third factor in credit scoring. Again, those with excellent scores have low balances. They pay them off with no interest charges. Okay, so credit card debt may be less than $3,500 on all their credit cards, but they have a $40,000 limit. And friends, some of you are going to want to open up your own business one day uh, or, or right now or have a side business, and you're going to want your credit score to be very, very strong so you can have this. You can have lines of credit available because every business knows there's a there's great times and then there's times where you're going to have to extend out that credit and use it to, to get cash flow. Those with 650 and below have very high balances. They kind of have like $4,500 with a total credit limit of 6000 and just cannot get out of that. And the big reason is their interest rates are so much higher. They're at that 25 to 29 percent interest rate, and it just—it's it, almost they're just paying interest on a minimum payment. No, no, nothing to equity. A lengthy credit history. We don't want to go out tomorrow and open up five credit cards because they'd probably be for the first time probably be low credit limits high interest rates and our credit history is going to get nailed. So have a lengthy credit history, 11 years of credit history and above. Those have excellent. So that's why we're trying to get the first steps rolling right now. And if you are in this number four, you already have that 11 years. Uh, excellent. Uh, make sure your limits are at the highest they possibly can be. Only apply for credit when necessary. Again, do not open several accounts at once. This will lower your score. And I, I've seen this in action several years ago. I was buying a used car for my daughter and we we're at Huggins Honda and a good old uh, used salesperson is uh, uh, Bob, I think. And he was a good guy, you know, he got our car. We were going to pay cash for it. And he's phone's ringing. Of course, every salesperson wants that phone to ring because that means good things are happening. He was working with a guy. He said, hey, do you mind if I take this call? He said, ah, go ahead. This person was coming from East Texas trying to buy a Honda Accord, you know, you know, maybe one or two years used. So Bob says, are oh, you coming in in an hour? All right, what have you been doing? 
he, why are you taking so long? Because well, I've been I've been going to every Honda dealership from Lufkin, Texas, all the way here. He goes, you done what? Hold on a second. He ran his credit score real quick because he's been working with them already. He goes, man, you're gonna gonna have to come up with another twenty five hundred dollars down because your credit score has just taken a two hundred point drop. It happened that fast. Trying to apply for too much credit and he was denied. The person was. Interesting, interesting. So we're always coming up with a strategy, my friends, in life. Choose those cars carefully. Choose them carefully. You know, anytime you're in a holiday shopping season, especially at Christmas time, and you're at the mall, somebody will say, or even online, hey, you know what? We can get you a credit card, a store card right now. Ann Taylor, a Victoria's Secret, Bath and Body Works, would you like one? Be careful because they're usually very high interest rates and they may only give you a three to five hundred dollar or even a seven hundred dollar limit. So that doesn't that doesn't really help you out. Yeah, they'll give you twenty percent off today for all your purchases, but but be careful on that. Be careful. And of course, seven the seventh step, the seventh habit is monitor your credit reports. Annualcreditreport.com is free. Um, if you get if you many of your credit card companies that you have right now or your banks will automatically monitor that for you and they always give you that free report there we go those seven tips that little area right there will really help you build and maintain a good credit score for the rest of your life and again you're just looking at rates uh, there's a big difference between five and ten percent uh, it, it's a thousand dollars a month. If you look at this monthly, just a quick calculation of, of a 5% rate to a 10% rate. So we want to be in the best area for our personal finances, for our financial health, and a good credit score will help you tremendously. What if your applications are denied? Here's a little right in here. Again, ask for uh, the uh, specifics because maybe there was an error put on. All right, so we get that information to the credit uh, bureau if you have an application denied. And that's what tipped us off in my daughter's case because she kept getting denied for a small credit card. I said, well, something's going on here. I know we have good credit. And then we came in to find out that someone had grabbed her identity and uh, we were able to fix that up. So, again, if you have errors, don't walk away. Don't think it'll be taken care of. You call the creditor. You dispute it. You can do it in writing, but right now, basically, you can get online and you can just check the purchase. Uh, and, and, and it's done very quickly now. You get the explanation that this was not me. I did not do that. Uh, again, good, good tracking. Uh, how many times have we thought that that was not what we charged? And then we really went back and looked at some of our purchases and maybe the company had a different name than what we thought it was. It's, oh, actually, I did buy that. So, again, uh, be very, very uh, judicial in this area. Again, the company card, the, the credit card company will get back with you, and they get back pretty soon. And as long as you're in dispute, nothing's going to happen to your credit score. But don't just think that, oh, I didn't charge that. That's going to be fine. Call them up. Get online check the charge as it, and say this is not mine I'm disputing the charge and they'll get back to you really pretty fast but if you delay and just and don't do it uh, and then don't pay uh, it's not going to work in your favor you're going to get your credit messed up yeah there we are when this happens this is where you have to do a lot of what we call leg work you're going to have to get on the phone you have to write letters um, you're going to have, and, and most of it now is, uh, excuse me, all online. You got to check everything and you got to just come back, come back. Definitely file the police report. The police report is very important because that uh, that is like the key to it all when you go back to that creditor and said, I filed the police report. Here's the here's the case number and I can fax that to you. Then they know you're, you're legit right there, that you haven't just made this stuff up. So, uh, but I also definitely recommend that you get on one of the credit bureaus uh, and you get your uh, identity.
theft reported and you buy into their service where you can lock down your account and they can look at anyone who has tried to open up account in your name. There we are right in there. Again, cancel things if they have to. If you've been stolen and you know your credit card's been stolen, please put, uh, that's when you'll call, get a new one immediately. And you can do that every year. You can always change that and just say, you know what, I think my, my identity's been compromised and they'll give you a new card without charging it for you or ATM as well. Shred all that personal information. There's dumpster divers out there looking for it, looking hard for it, especially if you are in an apartment where, they, where it's just an open uh, you know, trash. Uh, again, there's some information to call. I think the book has some good things right in here. And again, your local police department will also walk you through the steps. Well, friends, that wraps up our first video lecture of the culture of debt, and that was the importance of credit. I hope we have a better understanding now of why we need credit. You, you're going to have to have it throughout your life. The different types of credit that you can use, okay, the closed-ended, the open-ended, the importance of good credit, and most importantly, how to build that good credit score. Co-signing alone, I hope you know now that it's not just putting your signature next to somebody else's. You are literally assuming all responsibility for that loan. And I'm not sure that's something that you really want to do. How to dispute billing errors and protect your identity. I hope you have a better understanding of how important that is. I hope you've enjoyed it. We're going to go into the next video. Again, how to dump that debt. So friends, make sure you're reading through your chapters because this will solidify our personal finance. I, I think it's a great book, and I think it's a book that you will keep for a very long time. So let's read through that and start working on your project. And then I'm going to come back, and we're going to look at how to get rid of debt. Make it a great day.